You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome. I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll explore ways to drive sustainable agricultural practices with a focus on the cocoa industry in Africa. As always, you can join today's conversation. Just join us with the hashtag Beyond Market. And you can also send tweets to my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, top cocoa producers Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana recently imposed a fixed living income differential of 400 US dollars per ton on all cocoa contracts sold by other country. Now, as part of plans to combat poverty among farmers. Ya Pepra Amekuzi, head of Cocoa Life, joins me to discuss how to drive sustainable practices in agriculture. Yeah, thank you for taking the time out to join us. Let's start with uh, you just briefly talking to us about the major challenges that today's cocoa farmer uh, faces in trying to increase yield and achieve a sustainable supply of the commodity. Sustainability should always be at the forefront for cocoa productivity everywhere. And in Ghana, we take that very seriously. Uh, from the Mondelez perspective, we are also taking that seriously by addressing the challenges facing cocoa farmers. Uh, the challenges are several and various in the sense that uh, we have farmers who are not producing the, 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 the optimum. Uh, cocoa is expected to yield about 16 bags per acre, but we still have um, about uh, several farmers producing about two bags per acre, all because of the, the, the attention that is not being paid to good agricultural practices. We need to address that, and that's what we are doing through training of the farmers on good agricultural practices, modern technology, and also uh, deploying adult labor on their farms. We also ensure sustainability by addressing environmental issues like deforestation. Cocoa thrives very well in forest areas. So there's that thinking that they should move into the forests to be able to get better yields. But then science has proven that if you stay on your cocoa farm, you make sure that you have about 444 cocoa trees on an acre, you have enough shade trees then it means that you, can, you don't need to move into the forest area. But apart from that, even on their own existing farms, we make sure they adhere to environmental practices that protect not only their cocoa trees, but protect themselves as cocoa farmers and protect their communities. And because we are all aware of the devastation of climate change on cocoa production. And then for sustainability, we need to address the issue of the community, how the community is developing. Where is the role of women? How do women participate in decision making and how empowered are they? Similarly, we have to address challenges that the farmers face to the extent that some farmers would want to use their children on cocoa farms or if not their children, maybe children of other people, because we have laborers who would deploy their children also on farms that maybe they have taken up as caretakers. So there are several ways, and as I said, various areas that we cover as Cocoa Life to ensure that cocoa is sustainably produced. And in that case, we are also ensuring the sustainable supply of cocoa in all the chains that you can think of. Now, yeah, I know that the challenges are, are many for these farmers, but in working on the ground with these farmers, what are those uh, perhaps one or two major challenges that these farmers continue to talk to you about and how, uh, or in, in specifically, in what ways is Cocoa Life helping to ad address or at least support them in that regard? I would mention two key challenges, and they are all to do with uh, productivity and how to uh, ensure that they have living incomes. For example, um, farmers are faced with uh, the challenge of getting the required labor to be able to produce at the optimum and using the right technology also. So it's a challenge around farm practices. If a farmer is able to adopt good agricultural practices, that farmer should be able to 
make the maximum out of even five acres if the farmer runs it as a business. And that is why Coco Life trains the farmers in good agricultural practices as well as running their farms as businesses. The second one is to do with the, the, the fact that Coco does not give farmers monthly incomes. Coco usually gives two incomes in the year, the major um, period and then the minor period, which total is about four to five months. So it's important that we get farmers to um, uh, venture into additional sources of income. And that is a big challenge for us. We are addressing that also by first of all, getting the cocoa farmers to look at the cocoa farm itself because cocoa pots are supposed to be rich sources of um, soap, fertilizer, toothpaste, um, toothbrushes, so many things. Now we even know that the cocoa pot can be crushed and added to um, the other uh, raw materials to make cement. So we are encouraging farmers to explore that as well. But beyond the cocoa farm, um, any farmer that seeks, for example, other forms of skill, where they can um, earn income from beyond the soup, etc. like maybe rearing animals, um, growing plantains, growing bananas, growing anything else to ensure that on a monthly basis like you and I, uh, they have at least an income. And that has also been addressed by Coco Life. Now, yeah, access to new farming methods and technology obviously is crucial if these farmers are going to uh, increase productivity and yield. Speak to us on what the emerging technology uh, is available to uh, cocoa farmers and is there a willingness on the part of these farmers to use them? As a start, um, the, there's usually a resistance for farmers to use new technology. For example, uh, farmers are used to using the machete to weed and even though it means that either they bring in laborers to help them weed or um, they weed and it takes a very long time so they are not able to weed as often as they should they still were quite resistant to um, um, the slashes that the motorized slashes that uh, are being introduced again in response to the fact that it took the machetes longer period for them to weed, um, the farmers were resorting to weedicides. And we know the effect of weedicides on the nu nutri nutrients within the soil, as well as the effect on the cocoa pod at the end of the day, in the sense that there will still be residual chemicals when it comes to the cocoa pods. So getting them to shift from the machete and the weedicide well, has been quite a task, but the people, the farmers who are, let me call them the early adopters, when they adopted that and their colleagues saw the benefit they are reaping, they are now more willing to um, take up the slashes and weed with the slashes because they are motorized. So it, in, the, in a sense, for one acre in the past, you could use maybe three, four, even a week or more to weed one acre. Now within a day, you can use the slasher to finish weeding. Similarly with pruners, um, cocoa thrives very well when it's pruned like any other um, fruit bearing crop. So in the past, farmers thought that the shade that cocoa provides is enough. So, but we realized that if it has too many leaves, then it doesn't have too many pots. So we encourage the farmers to prune. And again, they were pruning with machetes. For us, we managed to shift them to prune with um, uh, what we, I would say pruners. But unfortunately, these pruners were also slow because they were manual pruners. Now we have introduced motorized pruners. And again, it makes it easier for the farmers. What is exciting about this is the fact that even though the older farmers are unwilling to do use the, the technology themselves, like maybe prune the farms, it's been taken up by the younger people and therefore has created employment for young people in our communities. Because when they prune, they get paid by the farmer. We have also introduced motorized carts so that when the cocoa is fermented in the farm, and has to be transported to the homestead to be dried. 
um, it, does, it doesn't mean that children should be roped in to carry the heavy wet cocoa to the farm, to the homesteads. Rather, the motorized carts are available and therefore the farmers are able to cut the beans in real time to the homes. And that has brought a lot of change when it comes to um, involving children in such laborious activities. Now, yeah, I'd like to ask you this, to just get your perspective. Now, it's often been said that when it comes to increasing uh, the, live, the overall livelihood of cocoa farmers, more attention is usually paid on increasing productivity, increasing yield, and less on what the farmer actually makes uh, for, all, uh, for all their hard work. Uh, hence that new uh, floor price that we had uh, recently, the $2,600 per ton floor price for cocoa. How do we create a balance where, you know, a lot of effort is, go is going into both increasing the, the, the productivity and yield of the farmer and ensuring that they get, you know, good uh, price for their cocoa? Well, um, for farmers to have living wages or living incomes, uh, we shouldn't only look at the price of cocoa. The price is very important. But if, for example, a farmer has five acres and is producing only two bags of cocoa, no matter how high the cocoa price is, uh, a bag, the two bags will not make the farmer, um, will not lift the farmer out of poverty. Or in the way I want to put it, will not create any wealth for the farmer. So we need to bring the farmer up to the standard so the farmer can reap the full benefit of the price. Again, uh, we have to look at other issues like the environment, like how children have access to education and all those other facilities that will make the community a thriving place, a place where the farmer and his or her family would like to live. So as you, as you see from what I'm saying, is the price all right, but productivity is very important. Environmental practices are important, as well as the development of the communities that they live in. So if, for example, I'm able to make, or the farmer is able to make uh, the maximum of even 16 bags, some farmers can make 24 bags. If the farmer is able to make to move from the five or six bags to 24 bags and you multiply it by the price, then we, you can say that you are creating wealth or the farmer has moved from poverty to a wealthy status. But if you increase the price and the farmer is still at the bottom, only producing two bags or three bags or four bags, you wouldn't have changed the, the, the situation of the farmer. You would maybe have eliminated poverty or reduced the poverty, but you wouldn't have lifted the farmer. We don't just want to elevate, uh, eliminate poverty or eradicate poverty. We want the farmer to be a proper, wealthy businessman cultivating cuckoo. All right, yeah, I must thank you for your time so far. We're just going to take a quick break here and we'll come back and pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to Ya Pepra Amekuzi. She's the head of Cocoa Life, uh, looking at, of course, uh, sustainable farming practices with a focus on cocoa in Africa. We'll continue right after the break. Because if you're just joining us, Ya Pepra Amekuzi, the head of Cocoa Life, is with me and we're discussing how to drive sustainability practices in agriculture. Yeah, let's pick up from where we left off. Let's start now with uh, your the 2018 Cocoa Life uh, annual report, which you just launched. And uh, you've talked about a uh, specific action so outlined in the report on how uh, Cocoa Life intends to achieve a sustainability uh, supply uh, for cocoa. Could you just share some of those uh, key highlights of the report with us? Definitely, we want to address deforestation. And um, because as the climate becomes hotter and hotter, uh, we realize that cocoa beans will not be, uh, uh, will, will not maybe achieve the volumes that we expect to achieve. We also make sure that uh, from our perspective, if the business is producing um, snacks, like chocolates, etc., where we are saying that snacking made right, then it means that we need to take a step back into our cocoa farms and make sure that cocoa is also being made right. Uh, 
the cocoa itself is being made right. And by being made right, it is being made sustainably. And to be made sustainably, we shouldn't look at only the cocoa tree. We should look at the people behind the cocoa tree, which are the farmers. So make it right by the farmers. Make it right by the people, even in our businesses. And then, at the end of the day, produce the snack that is being made right. So sustainability is very important for us. We are looking at um, maybe reaching about 200,000 people across our key origins who are benefiting or um, 200,000 farmers who are benefiting from the program that we have, but really reaching indirectly about 1 million people. Because behind every cocoa farmer, there are several people, and that is why the community approach that we have will also ensure sustainability. Are you also working with the government with this? I know that obviously for this to be a success for Cocoa Life partnerships, the partnering with the right stakeholders uh, is key. Talk to us about those partnerships, especially with the government. Our key partner in Ghana is the Ghana Cocoa Board. If you move to all the other key origins, we work with the government agencies. But if I should just focus on Ghana for now, Ghana, we work with the Ghana Cocoa Board that regulates cocoa, the cocoa industry in Ghana. As a result, uh, we have worked with the Ghana government, for example, in their research institute, which is the Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana. We are consistently working with them to look at how best cocoa uh, can um, um, uh, be developed, the cocoa tree and the resistance and all the other resistance to disease, resistance to the weather and all the other issues. And again, when you look at the seed that is produced, we are able to then work with the seed production department of the same Ghana government. Apart beyond the cocoa th that uh, they produce, when the seedling is on the farm, when it's in the ground, then Ghana government, again through Ghana Cocoa Board, supports us with what we call the cocoa extension agents. These are technical people who are with the farmers all the time, guiding the farmers on good agricultural practices and also being able to detect when something is not going right on the farm and reporting back into research again for the corrective measures to be taken. Apart from Ghana Cocoa Board, we work with the National Board for Small Scale Industry, which is a government agency. As I mentioned earlier, we are looking at additional sources of income for cocoa farmers and therefore we need to tie in with government projects that provide that kind of support. So then NBSSI is there to train the farmers not only to run their farms as businesses but also in additional businesses and then they look at packaging, they look at where to sell their products, they look at raw materials all the things that the farmers need to be able to run their businesses. And then they provide them oftentimes with equipment and machinery that they need. We don't pay because of that relationship we have with the government agencies. Coco Life then doesn't have to buy these equipment. They are supplied by the government agency. And then one key thing is that many cocoa farmers are not as literate as you and I. And therefore, we have this literacy program, functional literacy program for all cocoa farmers. And this is also run by a government agency called the Non-Formal Education Division. And then, of course, we have the strengthening of the cocoa cooperative unions. We have at the moment 17 cooperative unions we work with. And to be able to sustain themselves as cooperative unions, they have been registered by the Department of Cooperatives, a government agency, and very happily they are audited every year, and therefore they are able to maintain their cooperative status and be able to transact businesses with any entity that they wish to do. So the government partnership is very important. At the end of the day, it might be that Mondelez will step away or the NGOs that we work with will also step away. But at least once they have the government um, agencies as partners, we believe that all the benefits will be sustainable. 
And that to, that's uh, maybe at this point, I have to mention that we work with a number of NGOs as well, international as well as national NGOs, working together with different expertise, but working together to deliver on Cocoa Life. Okay, if I could just get your perspective on the Africa continental free trade area. Obviously, you're, you're aware of that. And uh, as Africa begins this journey, uh, getting access uh, to, uh, that's for the farmers, to both regional and global value chains, chains will become necessary at some points, especially to increase uh, the, the livelihood of these farmers, uh, not just for cocoa farmers, for the entire agriculture sector on the African continent, but for the cocoa farmers themselves, as you know, the AFCTA you know, takes off and as this integration begins to take shape, how can cocoa farmers benefit from this? Well, I'm quite excited that the headquarters of this is going to be in Accra, in Ghana. So uh, we, we, we are following the, the whatever is going on with keen interest. The farmers, um, Thursday, last week Thursday, there was a big meeting organized by Ghana Cocoa Board to push the new agenda of farmers coming together as different cooperatives. Because as cooperatives, they will be able to transact business and they will be able to transact business on the continent, especially because once the cocoa beans is theirs and they look uh, through this arrangement, they are able to find markets on the continent, they will benefit. And again, uh, they'll be able to make decisions about how to maybe make better decisions on how to sell their products, or maybe not just the raw product, but get into partnership or get into partnership with investors who will then convert their product into, um, by adding value to their product. So I'm very excited about this. And I believe that our farmers have been positioned to be able to transact business because already um, we have two ways of dealing with the farmer unions and the Mondelez International. We have Cocoa Life as a program, working with the farmers, providing the training, providing the support. But then uh, we are lifting, let me, uh, when I say lifting, it sounds a bit condescending, so I want to lose that word. But we are working with them, facilitating their uh, ability to engage with businesses and therefore if the continental trade arrangement really takes off I believe that they will be well prepared for that. Now for Coco Life you said that you're focusing uh, your intervention areas uh, in areas where you can make the most impact or difference could you just uh, elaborate further on that? Well there are so many places where we you would say um, require an intervention like Cocoa Life. But then uh, we need to also be strategic about it in the sense that um, if, for example, you need to address child labor, you don't just um, address child labor maybe in your supply chain because you might make an impact by wouldn't in the supply chain, but you wouldn't have made an impact across the country or across all the key origins. So we, when we say that where we would make more impact, it means that we will make sure that we are addressing this through our community approach because we'll make better impact. Again, there are some communities where um, they are, they've lost interest in cocoa, maybe due to mining, due to deforestation, due to the encroachment of, uh, of uh, urbanization. So such communities, no matter the intervention that you put in place, you might not make any impact. But where communities that, uh, where you have communities that need an intervention like Coco Life, and you work with the communities and community members are willing to work with you, then you know that increasingly it's not going to be just an impact for the business, but it's going to be impact for the communities because, uh, well, with Cocoa Life, I always say that we have two imperatives. We have the business imperative and we have the development imperative. We cannot lose sight of the development imperative. Otherwise, we cannot really hold any brand up and say snacking right. It's very important that we have those two working together. And that is why we are always looking for where we can make better impact. 
All right, yeah, thank you so much for talking to us today. We appreciate uh, your time on the show. I've been speaking to Ya yeah, Pepra Amakuzi, head of Coco Life, looking at, of course, sustainable agricultural practices on the continent with a focus on the cocoa sector. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember that you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily and have access to all previous episodes of Beyond Market on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Market and you can follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. From myself and the team, it's bye for now.